unless you live in a cave, you probably know of the Flintstones. The 60s animated comedy about a Stone Age family that produced spin-offs, movies, games, vitamin gummies, and cereal brands. It was the first primetime animated comedy aimed at an older audience and served as a parody of America post-World War II, with its consumerism, suburban sprawl, and nuclear family living. There have been many comics based on the Flintstones, but the one I'm focusing on today was put out by DC in 2016 and written by Mark Russell. During this period, DC Comics released a line known as the Hanna-Barbera Universe, taking classic characters and spinning them in wild directions. The Scooby-Doo gang was placed in a zombie apocalypse, Snagglepuss was turned into a gay playwright during the McCarthy era, and the Flintstones were turned into a socio-political commentary of modern American life while still retaining its comedic Stone Age aesthetic. This video essay will look at what Mark Russell's The Flintstones has to say about American society and civilization as a whole by going through the events of each chapter and then following with analysis. Chapter 1. A Clean Slate. Our story opens in the modern day with a museum tour remarking on a preserved Neanderthal whose origins have been wiped from history. We're taken back in time 100,000 years to the iconic town of Bedrock. This opening page is rife with parodies of modern franchises. Target is Tar Pit, Savings and Loan is Gravel and Loan, and Plato's Closet is Plato's Cave. Both a pun and a nod towards Greek philosopher Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Plato describes a group of people who have lived chained to the wall of a cave all their lives, facing a blank wall. The people watch shadows projected on the wall from objects passing in front of a fire behind them, and give names to these shadows. The shadows are the prisoner's reality, but are not accurate representations of the real world. The shadows represent the fragment of reality that we can normally perceive through our senses, while the objects under the sun represent the true forms of objects that we can only perceive through reason. This allegory will be important for the overall themes of the story at large. Fred Flintstone is tasked by his boss, George Slate, owner of Slate's Quarry, into convincing a group of Neanderthals to join the company, since they can do more work than a homo sapien for half the pay. Already, we're dealing with racism exploited by capital interest. Before Fred can dazzle the Neanderthals with the glory of civilized society, a detour is taken to the Veterans of the Paleolithic War Hall. Fred and Barney take place in a veteran support group for those who fought against the Tree People. The concept of war being used to propagate land ownership is brought up. The Tree People had no concept of land ownership and thus could not comprehend what the Bedrock soldiers were attacking them over. The results of this was genocide and a generation of mentally scarred young men. This scene is wrapped up with an advertisement for high-class condos using the conquered land. Later in the series, we'll see just who can actually afford these homes. Next stop is a boxing match, where the Neanderthals are noticeably disturbed by the crowd's lust for violence. We're also introduced to the bedrock citizen's god, Mort. This is followed by a trip to Outback Snake House, where fittingly snake-based appetizers and entrees are served. A Neanderthal wonders why they couldn't order the bison on a treadmill, with Fred answering that it's an air conditioner. The Neanderthals are put to a day's work at the quarry, working all day, smashing big rocks into tiny rocks, and then as payment, receiving a small pile of rocks, bedrock's currency. This calls back to the classic adage of the man who works all day to make a dozen loaves of bread in order to afford one loaf of bread. Fred and the Neanderthals are invited to a party at George Slate's house. Slate takes great pleasure in showing off his possessions, including the land of his quarry, which was gained after the Paleolithic War. Slate explains only a man's accomplishments are what stand the test of time and will be remembered. Slate dares a Neanderthal to kill a nearby mammoth, offering his nice necklace as a reward. The Neanderthal chases the mammoth and the ice crumbles beneath them, taking the mammoth, Neanderthal, and necklace with it. The Neanderthals choose not to work for Slate, with one remarking, no offense, but it seems Seems like the whole point of civilization is to get someone else to do your killing for you. Along with this is a side plot of Wilma creating canvas hand paintings and getting them displayed in a local gallery. To her dismay, 
Her work is placed in the back lot outside the gallery where it is ridiculed and mocked by hipsters. Wilma explains to Fred that these paintings are important to her because they harken back to her cave-dwelling childhood, where her entire family would place their hand paints next to each other on a wall, cementing their connection to each other and serving as a sign that they existed. We cut back to the modern-day cold open. It's now clear the Neanderthal on display is the one who fell in the ice. There is no record of bedrock, Slate's quarry, or any of the people who live there except this one unfortunate Neanderthal. If you're a fan of Watchmen or Breaking Bad, you may be familiar with the sonnet Ozymandias, written by Percy Bysshe Shelley. While more serious in tone, the series repurposes elements from the show in clever ways. The loyal order of the water buffalo is repurposed into a fraternity of veterans. Slate's quarry is used to make a direct statement about the nature of wage labor by spending all day breaking rocks to earn a small pittance of rocks. A common criticism of a capitalist society is that wage labor is essentially stealing profits of one's labor. Notice how Fred now works for the man who owns the land that he fought for. In a more just society, would Fred not be entitled to partial ownership of the quarry? The Neo-Paleolithic War has two real-world events to pull from. It's reflective of European colonizers going to war with Native Americans for land ownership. Native Americans did not have a concept for contractual ownership of land and were soon overpowered by the colonizers and routinely lured into submission through contracts which would inevitably be broken. The second connection is to the Vietnam War, a war historically regarded as cruel and unjust where the Americans served as an invading army to wipe out soldiers, citizens, and children alike, leading to what could only be considered genocide. This was mainly provoked by our alliances with countries like France, who were also in the process of colonizing Vietnam for their own means. Even worse, the unpopularity of the war led to returning veterans not only reviled by protesters, but ultimately abandoned financially by the government they fought, suffered, and were maimed for, leading to a massive population of veterans succumbing to homelessness, drug addiction, and mental illness. From this first chapter, we see a microcosm of the overall themes of this 12-issue run. Our modern capitalist society was built on a foundation of exploitation. Capitalists like Slate inspired his fellow men to go to war with a vilified group to claim land from a people who never even believed land could be owned. Then the ones who did the hard work are cast aside and delegated to the servitude of the owning class who waste the labor and profits of the land on a superfluous idea of society, one where others do the working, cooking, and killing for you. While Bedrock may have cars, restaurants, and fancy clothes, the road to getting these things was paved on the suffering and lives of others. It is a society of manufactured consent where cruelties and suffering are passed down the line for the sake of an imagined stability. All this is at its core done to inflate the egos of the ruling wealth in some dream that they will never be forgotten by society. Yet, as we see, nothing lasts forever. And in the end, the only thing that truly stands the test of time is the connections you make with the people around you. People over possessions. Community over commerce. This is the major driving thesis of this comic, all of which is extrapolated further in the following chapters. Chapter 2. Buyer Beware. Chapter 2 introduces Bedrock to the world of televised news. Immediately, a graphic death is shown and then pushed aside for the newest craze in Bedrock. Crap. This is a term for all the animals repurposed into random appliances and trinkets like can openers and weed whackers. This is also the most lowbrow the series gets. The pastor at the Church of Morp makes it clear that animals were once considered a conduit for the messages of Morp to guide humans, such as following a bird migration to water. This can be considered a form of animism, the world's oldest of religious practices that says all things have essence and spirit to them. The pastor then unveils the voice of Morp, which turns out to be a bird record player playing obnoxious club music. Here we see consumerism corrupting and assimilating religion. Barney Rubble makes a poignant point. Yeah, nobody really needs their crap. It's just there to keep you from looking like a bum. Fred laments how much all this crap is costing him, but wants to keep buying as a way to keep Wilma and his family happy. A businessman takes advantage of this need by convincing him to sell worthless vitamins door to door, even suggesting Fred use his veteran status as a sympathetic selling point and maybe faking an injury. See here how capitalist interests continue to take advantage of the downtrodden. 
After the record player fiasco, the Morp pastor renounces Morp and unveils their new god, Peaches, a pink elephant who is quickly outed as a vacuum cleaner. While Fred fails to sell any pills, Barney uses the super strength of his son Bam Bam to sell tons of bottles as a miracle pill. Honest work rarely pays as much as dishonest work. With animals converted to crap, an unorthodox god is crafted. The invisible, formless god, Gerald. This brings the Stone Age of Bedrock closer to our modern American Christian conception of God. Finally, after a heartfelt talk with Wilma, Fred returns all his crap and takes home the iconic Dino as a pet because he doesn't actually do anything. The theme at the heart of this chapter is purpose. Modern society tells us the purpose is to work, make money, spend money, and keep society as a whole looking good. Mostly for the sake of the capitalists who profit from rampant spending. Outside of this, people turn to religion, but when religion becomes another tool for capitalism, the whole thing falls apart and people lose faith. The Empty Throne of Gerald is a clear visual representation of a religion becoming hollow and empty as tradition and objects of reverence are monetized and consumerized. Unable to keep up with societal demands, Fred feels useless. There's a classic idiom of keeping up with the Joneses, which has existed in many forms throughout history. The clearest modern origin of this phrase is a comic strip by the same name. Here, a family continuously tries to match the social status of the ever-prosperous but never-seen Joneses. This was played for laughs in the comic strip, these desperate attempts to compete with a family that we never even see. Unfortunately, this idea became co-opted by capitalists to sell more crap by competing neighbors against one another in a superficial race to spend the most money on the most worthless things. Remember, nobody really needs their crap. Fred and Wilma's decision to trade back most of their crap circles back to the overall message of the Flintstones. Owning things doesn't make people happy. Experiences and connections with people make people happy. In this chapter, we see a continuing critical look at the concept of private ownership as a whole. Chapter 3, Space Oddity. We open on Pebbles and Bam Bam taking a school field trip to the local planetarium. Notice their school mascot is the Fighting Tree People, adding insult and mockery to the genocide. At the planetarium, we're introduced to Professor Sargon, a parody of famous astronomer, physicist, and more, Carl Sagan, who attempts to catapult a monkey into space by placing it on one end of a giant seesaw and dropping a dinosaur on the other. Not surprisingly, this ends in a bloody mess. Then aliens arrive in Bedrock. Slate immediately offers to be their puppet dictator because he's the richest guy in town. But in truth, the aliens are uninterested in Bedrock, and just charted Earth for bureaucratic reasons. We touch back with the veterans. They lament being treated as heroes for about a week, and then struggling to even find low-level employment. Once they were conscripted to be warriors, but those warrior skills have little profitable use in civilized society. Bedrock is then besieged by alien frat dudes, turning the city into a playground and going as far to kill people for fun. The parallel between Bedrock and the Tree People cannot be ignored, an advanced civilization invading an underdeveloped one. We see a fair and balanced news program remarking that the alien invasion is stimulating the funeral business. Ridiculous apologia. The veterans fight against the aliens, but what really saves the day is Pebbles, Bam Bam, and Sargon sending a spacefaring message to tattle on their parents. Bedrock is left with a guardian, the iconic Great Gazoo, which turns out to be a job title which translates to Game Warden. A statue honoring the hero of the day is unveiled to the chimp who died in the space flight earlier. Perspective is at the heart of this chapter, with the viewing of other people as lesser leading to abuse. Let's go back to Plato's allegory of the cave, where shadows on the wall are mere reflections of a wider world. The people of Bedrock saw the tree people as savages threatening their civilized society. The aliens saw Bedrock as savages, not even worth conquering, and only intervened in their children's destruction out of embarrassment more than an actual respect for the people of Bedrock. And then, of course, there's the soldiers who were used to fight and then discarded. Remember, no matter how advanced or civilized you think you are, there's always a bigger fish. Chapter 4 Domestications This chapter tackles two topics that unexpectedly cross paths. Coercive servitude and the nuclear family structure. 
In the cold open, we see a starving animal choose subservience to humans in order to receive scraps of food they hunt and cook. Fast forward and now animals are either purchasable appliances or pets. Considering these are sentient creatures capable of speech and thought, this essentially makes them chattel slaves. Switching over to our titular couple, they are at a married couple's retreat, which is taboo for Bedrock. You see, in Bedrock, the man-wife nuclear dynamic is seen as new and degenerate compared to the conservative values of the sex cave. The pastor of Gerald runs this retreat and makes it clear that the purpose of nuclear marriage is strict gender roles to benefit society. The man goes to work, laboring and making money, the woman spends it and is subservient and takes care of the home. Pastor makes it clear that these gender roles are intentional. The implication is made that the nuclear family is a way of domesticating women by making them subservient to men, but also making men subservient to societal norms and structures. While there is a hierarchy in the household, that hierarchy supports the overall hierarchy of a capitalist society. An angry mob shows up to protest the married couples and hijinks ensue. But the important wrap-up comes with the aptly named queer couple, Adam and Steve. Fred refers to them as non-birthers, and explains that in the past civilization, their kind were a great benefit to society, picking up the slack while the men were out hunting, or the women were gathering to help raise and nurture the young. At the Flintstones household, the armadillo bowling ball and elephant vacuum cleaner become friends and reliant on each other. And then there's a line from Professor Sargon that spells the whole thing out. The invisible force, that which controls the universe and sets all things in motion, it's called loneliness. From there we can surmise the theme of this chapter. We see the toxic idea of getting someone else to do your killing for you turn on its head in the cold open. The starving animal, unable to compete with the humans, chooses to join them for survival. While the animals are welcomed as pets, we see down the line how the animals have entered into a willing but coercive servitude. While they're used as appliances, essentially slaves, they are also given homes and food. The appliances refer to pets such as Dino as Uncle Dino, a play on the Uncle Tom insult applied typically by black people to other black people who they consider to be race traitors or subservient to a higher class. This goes back to the conflict of interest between field slaves and house slaves. While field slaves toiled in the field, house slaves lived in the house. House slaves dressed, ate, and spoke like their masters, often acting against the field slaves to maintain their favorable position. While the life of an appliance is nowhere near the cruel and inhumane chattel slavery of America, the themes of dehumanization and coercion are there. Loneliness is a core part of the human experience, a drive to make connections with others. These connections eventually lead to the civilization we see in bedrock. But there's a problem. The capitalist need for a functioning society that produces ever-expanding profit forces connections to be dictated and monetized. In the case of appliances, their ownership decides their status as tools. For man and wife, their genitals decide their lot in life. That's why people like Adam and Steve are reviled by society. It's seen as a threat to the idealized structure of the nuclear family. If gender norms can be subverted, then they aren't facts of reality, but of choice. And if people have the freedom to ignore them, it changes society and those who benefit from the nuclear norm lose power. But it really isn't a threat. There's no reason two married men can't work, raise children, etc, etc. As Fred points out, there's historical value to these couples. In Bedrock, a man and woman marrying is seen as degenerate and strange. In our modern age, it's the norm. So in reality, there's nothing that demands people form connections in these strict manners other than for benefiting certain people in society, mainly capitalist and religious ruling classes. And at the heart of the religious structure, if we're comparing Gerald to the Christian God, is ultimately patriarchy. The creator of the universe is a man. The first created human is a man. Men are meant to be rulers, warriors, and providers, while women act as child rearers, homemakers, and sex objects. Each has their role, but one is clearly held above the other. This is presented not as religious practice, but scientific reality. Trust, obey, and do it cause daddy said so. Do it cause daddy said so. Cause daddy knows best. Mom. 
Thus, we see how capitalist economics and religious dogma cross-pollinate to create a strict, bigoted society that eventually benefits neither party. Chapter 5. Election Day. It's voting season in Bedrock. We see a middle school bully running for class president with his slogan, Vote for me or I'll punch you in the beef. Cut to the bedrock mayoral debates where the issue of the lizard people stealing ferns arises. The current mayor wants a reasonable, measured approach. His opponent, Claude the Destroyer, essentially wants a scorched earth plan to wipe the entire people out. The crowd loves the appeal to pride, aggression, and the hearkening back to the old days of the proud Paleolithic War. It's noted that Claude the Destroyer is only named as such because of his father, Mordok the Destroyer. Claude has never actually destroyed anything. Claude is a son riding the coattails of his accomplished father, using nostalgic rhetoric and old-school us-versus-them animosity to rile up a crowd. The parallels between Claude and the middle school bully are clear. Over coffee, Fred and Barney discuss their time in the war, with Fred explicitly calling it a genocide. In a flashback, we see George Slate and none other than Mordok the Destroyer banding together to convince the pre-civilized people of Bedrock to attack the villainous tree people to protect their families and claim their land for a better life for themselves. Fred and Barney succumb to this fear-mongering. Only after wiping out the tree people entirely do they realize their battlefield had actually been homes containing children. The only survivor left is an infant Bam Bam, who Barney takes home to raise. At the middle school, we see how Ralph the Bully's campaign strives on intimidation and theft. The intellectuals join with Ralph in his heinous deeds just to avoid getting beaten themselves. His opponent, despite sound policy, is too weak of will to defend himself from even basic insults. Pebbles lashes out, remarking that we keep electing leaders who are weak enough to be bullied into submission. So in desperation, we turn to side with the bullies. An if you can't beat them, join them situation. Even if the bullies' plans would make life worse for society overall. The crowd cheers for this, and Pebbles is elected. This is the most politically charged chapter of the Flintstones and seems to be a commentary on liberalism versus fascism. Liberalism is one of the basic foundations of what built the United States of America as imagined by the Founding Fathers. These ideas sprung out of the Enlightenment movement, which strived to move society away from the religious divine rule of kings towards a more rational democratic society. Fascism can be a bit harder to pin down. While fascist-style societies have existed in the past, such as monarchies, the term would not solidify until the early 20th century in Europe with leaders like Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler. Fascism tends to have a few defining features as laid out by historians and political writers such as Stanley G. Payne and Umberto Eco. Fascism tends to have a perceived strongman leader at the top whose word is revered and must be obeyed under threat of punishment. There's a focus on patriarchy, glorifying masculine traits such as aggression, dominance, and a rejection of emotional vulnerability. Fascists reject democracy in favor of strict social hierarchies, whether they be based on race, class, gender, or other. There are in-groups and out-groups which determine the level of benefit and exploitation that society heaps on them. And one of the most important traits is a revolving door of enemies to be combated through violence to produce a strong us-versus-them mentality, where the in-group is naturally superior genetically and morally, and thus has a right to dominate the out-group, oftentimes with the religious justice justification tacked on. Ralph the Bully is a fascist, using fear and intimidation to get what he wants. You're with him or you're against him, and his opponents are too cowardly to go against him. Ralph's opponents are portrayed as a standard modern liberal, someone in the center of American politics and interested in preserving the status quo. While often well-meaning and in most cases competent enough to keep the lights on, liberal civility politics often cause them to falter at the radical, brash, and brazen crowd-pleasing antics of the fascists. We saw this with Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton in 2016. While Clinton's platform was more favorable to public needs and desires, and infinitely more coherent, Trump's brazen attitude and passionate speeches hearkening back to the good old days of tough men, Christian nationalism, and strict social order invigorated the populace, especially the massive percentage of the population known as the baby boomers, who are old enough to remember the excessive patriotism of the post-World War II era, the era which the Flintstones originally parodied. More than just succumbing to the fascist crowd-pleasing antics, liberals falter against one major force in America. 
Capitalism. America was founded on capitalism in the idea of private ownership of land, production, goods, and even human beings. If you can afford it, you can have it. But how do the sellers get it in the first place? This is answered by George Slate and Mordock the Destroyer. Convince your countrymen to follow your lead and then reap their rewards. Getting someone else to do your killing for you. With Claude, history is repeating by creating new enemies to gain political favor. Fascism, by its nature and design, always serves the ruling classes of society in the end, as both are hierarchical structures. Even when they speak about dismantling corruption and populist beliefs, the fascist is not a communist or an anarchist. They are not interested in eliminating or flattening social political hierarchies. They want to be the hierarchy, the owners, controllers, and beneficiaries. All of this is, in truth, antithetical to liberal democracies. As such, fascists and capitalists almost always join hands. Though the level of cooperation can vary because a capitalist society can exist under fascism, but a capitalist society cannot exist under the politics of the left, such as socialism, communism, and anarchism. Only by resisting wild fear-mongering and intimidation can these people be combated, and it takes more than a liberal to do this. Chapter 6. The End of the World as We Know It We're shown the benefits of Bedrock's modern Stone Age society. Fully stocked malls, funding for scientific advancement, and dwindling crime rates. A news pundit attributes all of this success and modernity to the people of Bedrock simply being superior to everyone else. It's a bit vague on how, though. We check back with Bowling Ball and Vacuum Cleaner lamenting over their repetitive, meaningless existence. But Vacuum Cleaner remarks that it's all worth it because of his friendship with Bowling Ball, getting to connect with another every day. Through some calculations, Professor Sargon determines that an asteroid will strike bedrock within a few hours, wiping out everyone. Civilization immediately devolves into violence and panic. Without the promise of tomorrow, there's no need for work, civility, or even law. Slate invites his workers to join him at his house to ride out the end of the world, but is rejected and ends up alone, with only his butler turtle for comfort. Then it turns out Professor Sargon's calculations were a big whoopsie-daisy, and the asteroid never hits. Society goes back to the way it was, with everyone feeling a little ashamed and humble. Faced with imminent death, the citizens of Bedrock immediately give up on their civility and turn against themselves with looting and violence. While the news pundit suggested their civilization was a result of them just being better people, it's really the other way around. Their civilization enforces stability and control, and without it, people revert to marauders. Even the holy concept of hell cannot stop them. A man like Slade has no value at the end of the world. What's the use of a job creator when the world won't even exist tomorrow? This chapter and many others drive home the point that at our core, human beings are simple and greedy. Civilization, with its structure and services and predictability, serve as a calming effect to keep the species in line. Without civilization, the only thing that we can rely on is our connections to each other to keep our worst instincts at bay. Now, this may seem like a very pessimistic view of human nature. You'll find there's a larger point to be made about human nature and its relation to society. Chapter 7. Another Day on Earth. Gazoo stops a predatory alien from tricking the Flintstones into signing away Earth's oceans in exchange for some beads. But when marauders come to steal their picnic, Gazoo allows this, as it's part of their natural evolution. At church, the pastor solves the question of why bad people get what they want and the good suffer by inventing hell on the spot. Later, the pastor answers the question of how he'll pay the bills by accepting payment in exchange for holy absolution, or in other words, getting in good graces with Gerald. Again, we see capital and commerce encroaching on religious institutions. At the quarry, a worker is caught in an explosion, covered in debris. Slate wants to keep work going, fearing the loss of profit, but Fred wants to man a rescue effort in the chances the man survive. Slate feels bad about this and visits the pastor, asking him how much it'll cost to get good with Gerald. All the while, Gazoo remarks that civilization exploits and exacerbates basic human functions and needs. Humans were mostly scavengers in their early lives never knowing where their next meal would come from. 
Soon they learned to hoard food in the form of agriculture, farms, and eventually the food service industry we see in the modern day. While civilization feeds these basic needs of food, stability, and safety, it turns humans voracious, always needing more, wired with that paranoid fear that they could lose it all within a day. Inherent traits that were necessary for survival are now taken to extremes that cause humans to turn on each other. Soon enough, the pastor sees the errors of his ways and stops accepting money for absolution. The trapped worker is found alive and freed. This chapter views bedrock from the eyes of Gazoo and his disapproval of human society. It remarks how natural human biological needs lead to this structure of society out of necessity and how its capitalist nature exploits the people. It's implied that one of the few things keeping people from doing bad things is a fear of eternal damnation. But when you can pay your way out of cosmic consequence, you can pretty much do as much as you can pay for. A commodified capitalist version of morality that equates wealth with goodness and gives more power to the wealthy. There's an implicit implication that morality is for the poor and weak, but the strong and wealthy are above all that. Megachurches are the most egregious example of this policy. These institutions take donations from all over the world and spend the majority of their wealth on massive churches with speakers, lights, and theatrics, tours, private planes, and other material goods. Their devotees donate this money in large quantities for many reasons. One such is the idea of paid absolution. By paying the church, you're paying God. Almost like putting into a retirement fund for your time in heaven. Pat Robertson was the founder of the Christian Broadcasting Network and host of the popular Christian program, The 700 Club. Robertson had many practices of paying for pair, but the one that shocked me the most was selling DVR recordings of Robertson healing the customer through prayer and through the TV, essentially turning holy repentance into a commodity. Look at similar figures like Joel Osteen and Kenneth Copeland and you'll find a litany of similarly egregious tactics preying on the religious faith of their flock. But the Flintstones also acknowledges that this is all a choice. We can choose to be greedy, to be predatory, or we can choose to do what truly benefits each other. People created religions and gods and also created hell. While many religions have afterlife worlds, many of them do not view those worlds the way Christians do, as eternal hellfire punishments. If the only thing keeping you from doing bad is God, and God can be paid off, then the real thing stopping you is your belief in God and your belief that money can sway him. In a way, money becomes your God. Chapter 8 the Leisure Class Our cold open shows pre-civilization and its enforced gender roles. Women gather fruit and men hunt meat. The hunters and the meat are seen as heroes and most important, even though it's shown the women gather more food and fruits and vegetables and have the secondary duty of raising children. In the present, Betty and Wilma are off to visit Wilma's mother's farm, leaving Fred and Barney to pick up their chores at home. Cue typical incompetent dad shenanigans. At school, Pebbles and Bam Bam are taught economics by a guest teacher. Their teacher boils economics down to a large scam ring that you can't escape. An example is made of Fred Flintstone getting a raise at work, coinciding with his landlord raising the rent. With advancements in production, we can make more, and thus sell more, and thus convince people to buy more, so the whole process expands infinitely like a quote, cancer. Mayor Claude the Destroyer wants to go to war with the tree people, but needs money. So naturally, the first choice is to defund Bedrock Children's Hospital. But this is unpopular with the female vote. Claude hires a celebrity to put out a commercial endorsing the trading of healthcare for warfare. At Wilma's family's farm, we get more glimpses into pre-civilization. Growing more food meant settling down. There was less need to hunt, but men were still in charge, while women were tasked with growing more and more food and raising even more children. We discover Wilma was going to be sold off as a wife by her father for the price of two goats. All of this culminates in a speech by Fred against Claude, purporting that men and women have intrinsic roles in society. The women give birth to children, and the men are meant to provide and protect those children. And he suggests that men have failed. While the women have kept up their bargain of cleaning the home and helping us produce more fruits and vegetables and food production, men have lost the need to hunt. 
and as such have less responsibility, but seem to have supplanted that with warfare. This plea falls on deaf ears and the measure passes. Children's lives are traded for weapons. In my opinion, this is the weakest chapter of the series. It's not that the critiques it makes are disagreeable. Women's roles in Western society have been classically relegated as lesser and subservient thanks to its patriarchal roots. However, I'd like to point out that this has not been the case uniformly throughout humanity. There's historical record that men and women both engaged in hunting and gathering, with sometimes the roles completely reversed. But since this series critiques America, we'll just focus on Western values. Rampant consumerism does lead to unhealthy expansion, and with it, abuses and then massive busts. As America embraced neoliberal policies, ones that embraced deregulation of business and defunding of social programs, led exactly to that. In the past two decades, America has gone through several boom-bust cycles, at rates unseen before. While corporate profits are higher than ever, the average person's wealth has either stagnated for years or more recently seen a downturn. This is not a new observation. It's been known for centuries and professed by economists and even fiction writers that this would become the case. Karl Marx's Capital, John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, even Dr. Seuss's The Lorax. These boom-bust cycles leave millions in debt, poverty, and jobless. But capitalists always seem to come out better than before. That's because this is a feature of the system and not a flaw. My issue is that these points are made so bluntly and tinged with a smug condescension that I feel the other chapters cleverly avoid it. There's the stereotypical incompetent dad jokes, and the way the economics teacher bluntly and straightforwardly professes his negative views. This is portrayed comedically, but comes off as spiteful and lazy in comparison to the rest of the series. Chapter 9. A Basket of Disposables In this chapter, we're introduced to the god Vorp, a big snake in a business suit introduced by a man who looks a lot like Friedrich Nietzsche. Vorp is the inverse of Gerald, embodying individuality to a fault, power, greed, and selfishness. George Slate takes the teachings of Vorp into his business by firing all of his normal workers and replacing them with Neanderthals and a gorilla that he can provide half pay to. This leads to record profits, not due to more sales or increased work, but simply from paying workers less. Fred was one of these fired workers, so Wilma buys him a new bowling ball to improve his mood. This leads to our reoccurring bowling ball character thrown in the trash, and vacuum cleaner leading an appliance rebellion to rescue him and several other captured appliances. George replaces his faithful but old and slow turtle servant Philip with Brutus, a trained hawk. The next day, he finds the woman he was courting has traded up to Claude because he has more money and power. Even Brutus the hawk joins Claude for a better deal. Slate learns the error of his ways, and rehires his workers. The theme of this chapter seems to be selfishness, or extrapolated further, the negative aspects of individualist thinking. There's nothing inherently wrong with individualism. It provides us with a sense of self to focus on preservation, happiness, and free will. But in the god Vorp, individuality is taken to a toxic extreme. The capitalist providing jobs cuts those jobs down for the sake of self-serving profits. Relationships are seen as status symbols, reduced to business deals where the highest bidder wins, almost a form of prostitution. People are just objects to be traded out when something better comes along, like replacing an old bowling ball. This kind of thinking is antithetical to society. Jobs become removed from the concept of production, wages, and even consumption into merely profit creation, which hurts the majority of society. Relationships are not done out of a means of love or care, but simply to up your social scale. We again come back to people over profit. It's not an anti-civilization statement at all, but instead a statement that individualist thinking does not build society, but instead it's our connections to each other that truly build society. If all of Bedrock operated under the teachings of Vorp, it would quickly devolve into a system of constant antagonism. With nothing but selfish material interest in mind, what levels would humans stoop to? Chapter 10, Buyer's Remorse. This chapter focuses on film, and more broadly, technology, with the news anchor remarking, every new invention comes with a question. 
Can I have sex with it? Or use it to kill people? Claude launches his first assault on the lizard people. But they all left the area before his army could even get there. A big waste of time and money. Continuing Wilma's artist arc, her paintings are thrown away by snooty gallery owners. But catch the eye of a high-profile film director, a parody of Werner Herzog. To continue funding the pointless war against the lizard people, Claude replaces retirement money with coupons to a local food franchise. Tragically, vacuum cleaner dies after being used to clean a movie theater floor. The public turns on Claude, with Fred remarking that their racism-based war against the lizard people is a luxury that they can't afford. Claude is tricked out of his position of power by giving him a fake job in a fake office and the old mayor's reinstatement. While any nation or community has the right to self-defense, we see that invasionary wars drain the wealth of the citizens and sometimes don't even benefit the people at the top. Post-World War II America experienced a boom for various reasons. FDR's New Deal was still producing great results for society at large. America made alliances both political and financial throughout the war. Manufacturing jobs were created to fuel the war. On top of that, a wave of returning soldiers were given great benefits for their service, as long as they were white, and created a large population of newly wealthy consumers, known popularly as the Baby Boomers. At a renewed sense of national pride and the message was clear, war is good for the economy, at least when you win. I spoke about the disastrous Vietnam War, so let's move on to the wide-reaching wars of the Middle East. After the tragedy of 9-11, Americans almost unilaterally launched the global war on terror just three days later. This was not just one war against one country or group, but multiple wars on shifting enemies that would officially last for 20 years, but still continue with smaller operations to this day. In the last few years, it's been admitted that the war on terror largely failed to end conflict, and was revealed to be a massive money sink for the American people. Billions were flowing into the defense budget, increasing massively year over year while infrastructure, healthcare, and education funding crumbled. It was revealed many of the regimes we funded turned into despots, mainly of the religious sort, stripping wealth and right from its citizens, especially its women. Many of these people were found to engage in slavery and human trafficking. It's been determined that the Pentagon, who manages the defense budget, has failed multiple audits, and that an estimated 40% of its budget is unaccounted for. All the while, the defense budget continues to inflate, while politicians discuss cutting Medicare and welfare benefits to balance the budget. Unfortunately, the Flintstones don't give us a real answer to this problem. We cannot just trick politicians into a fake office and appoint someone else. But let's move on to the next chapter. Chapter 11, Neighborhood Association. Our cold open shows two birds comfortably sitting in a tree, until Bam Bam chops the tree down and uses the wood to make a birdhouse, too small for both birds. Bam Bam considers this a good deed. Hipsters are moving in, starting vegan restaurants and picking fights with Fred over a gaudy statue Barney made for him. This escalates to the hipsters forming a neighborhood association and walling off the Flintstone house as its own neighborhood. Eventually, Fred gets rid of the statue after even Barney admits it's hideous. At the same time, the zoo is dealing with a galactic version of the neighborhood association, who are considering wiping out Earth before humans can grow into a problem, like trimming hedges or cutting out early stage cancer. They decide this by scanning a local of bedrock, one chosen by Gazoo. Seeing no malice in the locals' thoughts, they give Earth and humanity a pass. With the punchline being that Gazoo had chosen the pet Dino, his simple mind saving humanity from themselves. Gentrification is the topic at hand in this chapter, with new rich residents moving into bedrock. They see bedrock as gritty and real, almost like a novelty rather than a living space. Despite this seeming admiration, these hipsters also want to control and mold Bedrock into something more fitting to their own sensibilities, ironically stripping Bedrock of its identity that they were so attached to in the first place. With Bedrock homes in higher demand, the landlord responds to this demand by raising rents. 
taking advantage of the new clientele at the expense of longtime citizens like the Flintstones. This has played out in the real world countless times. An underdeveloped area is bought for cheap by landlords, house builders, etc., and inject money into creating newer, more modern structures. With all this money being poured in, a return on investment is expected, so the rent and price of these homes is jacked up. Now, with a new, wealthier consumer base, the landlord can raise their rent on existing citizens. This forces them to either accept the hike in price or, in many cases, move out and let the wealthier base in. This inevitably breaks up families, changes the culture of an area, and leaves people homeless and destitute. This is what happens in real life, but is not focused on as much in the chapter. The Neighborhood Association is seen more as a snobby nuisance than a material threat overall, with the rent hike being mentioned and then passed over, and the whole issue of the gaudy statue being resolved without much issue. In the real world, these kinds of conflicts aren't brought over gaudy statues, but typically over race, religion, and other kinds of groups. And as one group moves in, they'll typically try to move another group out. And if that group has more money, the power system of our capitalist society, they will tend to win. And unfortunately, for many people throughout history, things were not happily settled as a mere inconvenience. People are forced to move out. People are forced on the street. Chapter 12. Farewell to Bedrock. We've reached the finale of the series and pick up with Gazoo almost immediately after saving humanity. Gazoo acknowledges the selfish and often reactionary nature of humans, but believes they're still in the infancy stage of their civilization and deserve a chance to flourish. This chapter serves to tie up some loose ends. Fred finally gets that promotion. Slate works on giving back to society. Bowling Ball finds a new friend in ShopVac. Science and religion are compared as ways of understanding and bringing meaning to the universe, two halves of the same coin for civilization that are not above each other. In the end, the Flintstones wraps up on a note of hopefulness, that human civilization can progress past profit and greed through reshaping the perspectives of the individuals that inhabit it, and this is mainly done through our connections with each other. At the heart of Mark Russell's Flintstones is a frank acknowledgement of American society's history of abuse, theft, and manipulation that built many of the luxuries it enjoys today. War, bigotry, and genocide are an undeniable fact of U.S. history. Central to this criticism is the concept of ownership. Whether it's owning a house, business, people, land, or crap, the concept of private ownership and the gluttonous need to grow more is at the heart of society's ills. The more you own, the more you can sell, and the more you can sell, the more you can own. For people like George Slate, it's funding war to conquer land, and then having the soldiers work the land for a fraction of the profit their labor produces. Thanks to private ownership, Slate can be a part of the leisure class a class that reaps the majority of the benefits while passing on a pittance of wealth to the people beneath them in exchange for labor, getting someone else to do the killing for them. In this way, so-called job creators are hoarders more than providers, in that if they didn't have private ownership of land, homes, and food, there would be no reason to work for them. This is capitalism, a system set up to provide a select few in society to be in charge of production and goods to then sell to the underclass of workers, who must then labor just to barely afford those goods. The more jobs you can provide, the more society relies on you, and so you have powerful leverage over people, society, and politics. The U.S. has been the poster child of private ownership and capitalism since colonizers laid claim to the land, more often than not by force. The Native Americans had tribes, territory for sure, but the idea of persons having a contract that gives them the right to control areas of land and its people by threats of imprisonment and death was foreign to them. While bedrock resembles modern American life, it's important to remember that society has not been shaped that way for hundreds of thousands of years. We did not go from communal hunter-gatherer societies to farms to nuclear family capitalism in a straight line. This form of society really took its shape and form in the 20th century, specifically 
post-World War II. Strict orders of production modes, gender roles, and family organization shaped this society. While it's undeniable that these things provided great material wealth to United States society as a whole, it is a common observation that these benefits are thinning out and have been for several decades. More and more wealth has been funneled into the hands of fewer numbers. The disparity of wealth in economic classes is widening and has been for decades with corporate profits exploding, the lower class expanding, and upward mobility has recently degraded to be worse than the previous generations. This is largely due to an overwhelming focus on supply-side economics and free market practices. Many of you might have heard these practices referred to as Reaganomics. President Ronald Reagan's economic plan was to loosen restrictions on business interests, while at the same time, reduce government spending on social programs such as welfare, healthcare, and education. The idea was that the market should lead the economy, and that reliance on government was bad for society at whole. It was proposed that with less restrictions and less money spent on regulatory practices, worker benefits, increased pay, unions, etc., the businesses could grow freely, creating more jobs and thus higher pay and healthy competition which would force companies to innovate and improve their products while also competing price-wise. What instead happened was corporations freed from legal accountability and restrictions cut their workforces, shipping many jobs overseas. A one strong contingent of unions in the United States was almost unilaterally crushed. Wages began to stagnate. Inferior quality products were flooding the market, and even though they were produced at cheaper and cheaper rates, their prices would inflate. On top of that, cutting government spending resulted in many people losing their welfare, retirement ages increasing, education suffering overall. There were mass closures of mental health hospitals, releasing many people onto the streets with no access to medication and treatment. Many of these people were also the veterans of the Vietnam War. The homeless population skyrocketed. Violent crime went up, the middle class began to shrink, and the AIDS epidemic was ignored, leading to mass deaths. By the end of his presidency, Reagan tried to course correct his own mistakes by raising taxes to levels higher than when he entered office. But the damage had been done. The already wealthy capital owners had even more power and influence, and their lobbying and donations to politicians created a socio-economic atmosphere where there were only two viable political parties, and both their economic policies were pro-corporate and anti-worker. To this day, this sort of neoliberal economics dominates both the Democratic and Republican Party in the American states, though there is some difference between the extreme degree of which. However, there is no strong leftist force in the party. There is hardly a socially democratic party. What you'll find when looking at global politics is that America's versions of left and right are often skewed compared to the rest of the world typically perceive that the Democrats are a centrist or left-leaning party. However, in many European nations, they would be solidly right-leaning. And our American right, the Republicans, are seen as extremists. This comes about because, in a classical sense, left-wing politics favors anarchal equal distribution of power, whereas the right-wing of politics favors strict hierarchical structure, like a pyramid. And it is in this structure that both capitalism and fascism thrives. This is the U.S. alive today, but it is not an inescapable fate. The answer is to turn away from an ideological society that values profit over all else. It requires a society of willing individuals coming together as a collective for individual good. While it's never directly stated, the Flintstones push against privatized ownership of production food and shelter, its anti-consumerism, and a focus on a healthy community where all are provided according to their needs, falls squarely into the realms of Marxist critique of capitalism. 
Karl Marx was a philosopher and writer who had a lot to say about the capitalist structure of society progressing in the 1800s. While he was not the first to critique capitalism, he has become the most iconic, with works like Capital and the Communist Manifesto, seeking to understand, deconstruct, and look past capitalism. Whereas the pro-capitalist argument is that a strict structure of labor and production would create great wealth for a nation and its people, Marx argued that this system would inevitably hit a toxic breaking point, where the drive for ever-expanding capital would create a society of dominant owning classes, subjugating and abusing the lower class to produce their ever-expanding wealth and leisure to ad infinitum, until eventually it would create a cannibalistic society where the head eats its limbs to feed its stomach, until eventually the whole body dies. The roots of capitalism can be found in thinkers such as Adam Smith, with its basis in the secular enlightenment era of Europe. It was proposed that private ownership by people, rather than the divine right of kings that monarchy provided, would create a world where innovative individuals could create their own businesses and earn themselves a good life, and that this would eventually spread to the rest of society. While capitalism undeniably created a societal structure that produced immense wealth, great technology, and an improved state of life for many, in the modern age, it has inevitably centralized and monopolized that wealth into the hands of a few at the expense of the many. Rather than seeing across-the-board benefits, we're seeing fewer and fewer people getting more and more of the money, while those beneath struggle harder and harder. It's been estimated that the average American worker works more days and longer hours than a peasant during the medieval times. American workers get less paid time off, less maternity leave, less sick days, and have weaker upward mobility compared to other European nations of similar prestige. This is the heart of Mark Russell's The Flintstones, a critique of the dominant socioeconomic system of capitalist consumerism, mainly informed by a Marxist perspective. However, it does end with a hopeful message. All of society is built by choices. People chose the current state of their civilization. Yes, there were manipulations and coercions by opportunists and unfair power structures at play, but the message is clear that individuals in society can choose to come together to collectively shape society more focused on altruism and making sure needs are met rather than benefiting a select few. Just as humanity chose capitalism as a better mode than hunting and gathering, farming, or the divine rights of kings, humanity can choose to move past its profit-driven competitive society. Remember Ozymandias, eventually time will reduce all to rubble, so use the time you can to connect to the people around you. Overall, I find Mark Russell's The Flintstones to be a great piece of gateway fiction. Something to sort of dip your toes into the water of capitalist critique and expose a person to other modes of economics and ways of structuring society. If you like this video, I would love for you to go out and buy both volumes of The Flintstones. Give them a good personal read. And if you're interested in going deeper into the themes that The Flintstone brings up, there are several books I could recommend for you here. If you've made it this far, I want to thank you very much for listening. Leave a comment letting me know what you thought of this video. Like and subscribe for more videos. Until next time.